On a midsummer's day in 1505, about a decade after Columbus discovered the new world, a young law student made his way through the marketplace in Erfurt, Germany. His name was Martin Luther. Now a friar in the Augustinian order of hermits, Brother Martin was bound by vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But strict adherence to monastic practice, endless acts of penance to God the angry judge, failed to bring peace to Martin Luther's troubled soul. In te domine sperate, in justitia tua libra me. If only some of our people, all of our people, could realize that in this psalm, David is telling us, in thee, O Lord, I trust. In thy righteousness, deliver me. If only everybody could understand these words, how much better they would understand God's righteousness. And what, dear brother, is God's righteousness? Well, exactly what scripture says, Father, that it delivers and does not merely judge. There is only one proper interpretation of scripture, that which the church has established. What if scripture were in the hands of common man, for every potboy and swineherd to read in his own language and interpret for himself? What then? Why, then we might have more Christians, Father. And so in 1511, Luther came to Wittenberg to be a teacher, student of scripture, and parish priest. Within another year, the priest of the castle church received his degree as doctor of theology. I promise to defend holy scripture, and I swear not to teach vain and foreign doctrines which are condemned by the church and offend the ears of the pious. So help me God and the Holy Gospels. Amen. Four fragments of St. Jerome And two of St. Chrysostom. From the veil sprinkled with the blood of the Savior. A morsel of the very bread eaten at the Last Supper. And this is a nail driven into our Lord's dear hand. A fragment of the true cross. A fragment of the true cross. Give me the list. 
With these and all the others I have brought, if a pilgrim were to venerate every single relic in our church, he would be forgiven of his time in purgatory. One million nine hundred and two thousand two hundred and two years. Now, Brother Martin, Doctor, you people's priest, you cannot afford to shatter their faith by tearing away its visible support. As their priest, responsible to God for their souls, can I afford not to? Symbols to inspire devotion, yes. But crutches to uphold a tottering faith? Doctor, when's all this sudden doubt? This is no sudden doubt, but a growing certainty. And here in my room, I've been preparing my lectures on the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. And here, I think I've found the truth at last. And when I found it, it was as though the gates of heaven were open to me. Romans 1.17 Eustits here enim day. Eustits here enim day, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so? Worthy vicar. Do we find anything here of relics? By faith man lives and is made righteous, not by what he does for himself. Be it adoration of relics, singing of masses, pilgrimages to Rome, purchase of pardon for his sins, but by faith in what God has done for him already through his son. Dr. Martin, if you leave the Christian to live only by faith, if you sweep away all good works, all these glorious things you dismiss as mere crutches, what will you put in that place? Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ. this time, ruled Pope Leo X, a Medici, the second son of Lorenzo the Magnificent. His predecessor, Julius II, had laid the foundation stone of St. Peter's Cathedral, and the new pontiff was determined to make it the most magnificent church in Christendom. Pope Leo, a lover of the arts, exhausted the Vatican's wealth by his lavish expenditure. To replenish the treasury, Leo arranged for a wider sale of indulgences, conferred cardinals' hats upon men who could pay, and offered archbishoprics to the highest bidder. Your Holiness will see clearly by this map of Germany what my brother wishes. This area, Your Holiness, remains to be assigned. These he already holds. Your brother must be quite rich. How we are to pay Michelangelo for the Sistine Chapel, we do not know. As for Master Raphael, we owe him thousands already. But God has given us the papacy. Let us employ it for his glory and enjoy it while we live. I am determined to leave Rome more glorious than I found her. And this shall be the most precious jewel in her crown. But back to our affairs. This petition of your brother 
suppose we do allow him to become Archbishop of Mainz. What arrangements can be made? Ten thousand ducats, Your Holiness, is as much as I am empowered to contribute. Shall we say rather twelve thousand? A thousand ducats for each of the twelve apostles. Your Holiness, with all proper respect, there are but seven deadly sins. Seven thousand ducats, therefore. Ten thousand, then. A thousand for each of the ten commands. My brother will be most pleased. As well he might be. Our paternal blessing to your brother. We grant his petition and accept his contribution to the treasury of Christ's church. But indulgences must be dispensed with authority, and rightly so. Therefore, when indulgences are abused, peddled, bartered, so this is not salvation. This is damnation of souls. And I do not refer to Tetzel alone. But God is no respecter of persons, and we must serve God, not man. Therefore, my people, I tell you, our Lord Jesus Christ, by coming on earth, by suffering and dying, has already paid for our salvation forever. How then can any mortal man, monk, prince, or pope, extort a further payment. My beloved, you cannot buy God's mercy. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, in this as in all undertakings, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Wittenberg, the eve of All Saints' Day, October 31st, 1517. Martin Luther was scarcely noticed as he passed by those waiting to worship before the relics about to be displayed in the castle church. Nailing a notice to the door of the church was not unusual. For this was the customary place to post announcements of both university and public events. Among those waiting to be forgiven and blessed, none could know that this document would become one of the most widely read in all history. Thus did Martin Luther put forth his 95 theses intended to be read and debated only by scholars. Word of their content created an immediate demand for more and more reprints. Printers had the theses translated into the language of the people. Within weeks, they were the talk of all Germany. Within months, all Christendom was on fire. 
It is better to give to the poor than to buy an indulgence. There, my lord archbishop. Translate it for everybody to read. Is it any wonder my sales have fallen off? True treasure of the church is the holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. Why, therefore, does not the Pope empty purgatory out of pure Christian charity? What drunken German wrote those? Martin Luther, a monk of the Augustinians. Yes. This before the publication of the theses. And now. I wish you would undertake to restrain this Martin Luther who is unsettling matters in Germany by preaching new doctrines. Time in a hundred years, a German has told Rome where to get off. There's Luther writing, knocking the Pope's crown off. There's the Duke sitting up there, listening to Luther. But you see that goose down there? Know what that means? Yes, Huss, John Huss who got himself burned to ashes for trying to clean up Rome. You see what they're trying to do to us? Here comes a German to lead us against Roman tyranny. And they're trying to make him out a heretic. Just like John Huss. Oh. Wittenberg by this time was widely regarded as a stronghold of Luther's followers. Despite threats of banishment, excommunication and imprisonment, Martin Luther, throughout two stormy years, had continued to compare church doctrines and practices with Holy Scripture. Martin Luther journeyed to hostile Leipzig in the company of his two most ardent supporters, Andreas Karlstadt, learned but impetuous, and Philip Melanchthon, a young scholar destined to become one of the foremost leaders of the Reformation. It is the sense of this body that sufficient argument has been heard on both sides. Dr. Martin Luther. In the name of our Lord, Amen. Out of reverence for the Supreme Pontiff and the Roman Church, I would have preferred to take no part in the discussion which cannot but lead to disunity within the ranks of the faithful. But out of respect for the truth, I repeat, it was not upon St. Peter that Christ founded the church, but upon himself. And who is that authority? St. Paul. For no other foundation can man lay than that which is laid, even Jesus Christ. But, Doctor... These attacks upon the Pope cannot help but bring disunity upon the Church. That is not my intention. But the effect is the same as if it were. It is not necessary for salvation to be subject to a Roman Pope. But, Doctor, that is the heart of the heresy. That is exactly what has said. It does not matter who said it, it is the truth. Martin Luther, do you think you are the only one who knows the truth? I will tell you what I think. I have the right to believe freely, to be a slave to no man's authority, to confess what appears to me to be true, whether it is proved or disapproved, whether it is spoken by Catholic or by heretic. Then you deny the authority of the Pope. In matters of faith, I think that neither counsel nor Pope nor any man has power over my conscience. And where they disagree with scripture, I deny Pope and council and all. A simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest Pope without it. Heresy, Dr. Luther. Heresy! Heresy! So be it. It is still the truth. Now we shall do some writing. Draw up a condemnation of this man. 
We shall see how his faith stands up against a papal decree. We can no longer suffer this serpent to creep through the fields of the Lord. The books of Martin Luther containing his errors are to be sought out and burned by the Inquisitor. As for Martin Luther himself, we give him 60 days to retract his writings. And failing such retraction, he shall stand under our anathema and excommunication. Signed, Leo, and sealed with the Pope's own seal. Your Grace, I did not come from Rome to joke with scholars. In the name of the Holy Father, will you deliver this heretic? It is not Luther the man who is important. It is a principle that a man accused shall have a fair trial before his own countrymen. Luther is my subject, Aleander. And as he owes me loyalty, I owe him protection. I can do no less as a Christian and a prince. I suggest, therefore, that we bring this cause before the Diet and let it be decided in that Parliament what shall be done with Luther. In the spring of 1521, Luther made his journey to the city of Worms to appear before the Diet the Parliamentary Assembly of the German States. Hear me, Father. Hear my prayer. Thou hast given me thy cause to defend here, thy precious word to uphold. Thou art my shield. Thou art my fortress. Let it be granted to me, Master, in my hour of need word to say for them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Dr. Luther, reply to the question. Will you or will you not recant what you have written? You have heard His Majesty's question. He is waiting for your answer. My answer? You should not ask me to deny in one moment the work of many years. Dr. Luther! Oh, oh, Will you tell us now? Do you persist in what you have written here? Or are you prepared to retract these writings? and the beliefs they contain. I am asked to retract these writings, but they are of different kinds. In some I discuss faith and good works. If I were to retract these, I should be denying accepted Christian truths. In others, I attack popery and assail men who have afflicted the Christian world and ruined the bodies and souls of other men. If I were to retract those, I should be like a cloak that covers evil. Most serene emperor, illustrious princes, noble lords, I am only a man and not God. But I must defend myself as did Jesus Christ when he said, as I say now, if I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. Martin Luther, you have not yet answered the question. Give us a simple answer. Will you recant? Or will you not? Here it is. Unless you can convince me by scripture, and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, Unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, 
I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Who is this monk to go against the church and against me? I should have seized him right then and there and had him. Yet he was under my safe conduct. I could not go back on my word. Your illustrious majesty, may I say that not even an emperor need keep his oath to a heretic? Twenty-one days we give him. After that, his book shall be wiped from the memory of man. His followers, whoever they may be, shall be condemned. And this Luther himself, he shall be under our curse. No man shall harbor him, no man protect him. I declare him hereby outlaw, free to be hunted, free to be seized by anyone, anywhere. Then to be done to death at will. On the journey back to Wittenberg, when armed horsemen spirited Martin Luther away, few knew that this had been arranged by Duke Frederick, who was fearful for Luther's safety. The Wartburg, a castle near Eisenach, had been chosen as a refuge for the heretic, now condemned by Pope and Emperor. During his ten months of exile, Luther completed his translation of the New Testament. What language is this, sir? Greek? Yes. I don't know Greek. Don't you read at all? Oh, yes, sir, but only in our own language. Look at this. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Those are the words of Jesus in the New Testament. In the 13 years since Martin Luther nailed the theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg, the movement for reform gained enormous momentum in a large part of Europe. Your graces, this confession of our preachers and ourselves sets forth the whole of our beliefs as they have been preached in our lands and churches. This is the sum and substance of our doctrine. Signed this day by John, Duke of Saxony, Elector of the Holy Roman Empire, George, Margrave of Brandenburg, Elector, Philip, Landgrave of Hesse, Prince Wolfgang of Anhalt, Duke Francis of Lüneburg, John Frederick, Duke of Saxony, Duke Ernest of Lüneburg, delegates of the free city of Nuremberg, delegates of the free city of Reutlingen. Your Imperial Majesty, we are not impelled by party spirit. We are compelled by the word of God to embrace our beliefs. We have desired only that the church might be cleansed and freed from certain abuses, not for our own sakes, but for the glory of Christ and the salvation of all men of all nations. Your gracious majesty, this confession will prevail against the gates of hell itself. Most gracious emperor, all of us have been entrusted with the word of God. As princes, we are eager for political unity, but not at the price of our faith. What you call differences, we call the heart of our faith. What you call heresy, we know. 
to be the truth. We will not yield. I command your allegiance. You cannot command our conscience. We will continue in our faith, no matter what may happen. We testify to the gospel of Jesus Christ, by whose blood we are free Christian men, free now and free forever. Amen. Amen. Thy right hand and thy holy arm, O Lord, hath gotten thee the victory. Thou hast remembered thy mercy and thy truth to this generation. O God, our Father, make us to stand fast in the liberty wherewith thou hast made us free, and enable us all to be faithful stewards of the gospel thou hast entrusted to us, that our hearts may be established unblameable in holiness before thee at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen.